So, 1 Kings chapter 20. In those days Hezekiah became sick and was at the point of death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came and said to him, And thus saith the Lord, Set your house in order, for you shall die and shall not recover. Billy, would you mind go getting me monk fruit, please? There should be a bowl over there. Then Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord, saying, Now, O Lord, please remember how I have walked before in your faithfulness with a whole heart and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. And before Isaiah had gone out of the middle court, the word of the Lord came to him. Turn back and say to Hezekiah, the leader of my people, Thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father. So he is the God of David. He calls himself by David's name. I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Behold, I will heal you. Which means that he's being reminded of his covenant with David and how David had taken the Lord's heart. He was the Lord's, basically he had stolen the Lord's heart. And the Lord was like, he thought of David and, ah, oh, now that's my son. I have heard your prayer, I have seen your tears. Behold, I will heal you. On the third day you shall go up to the house of the Lord, and I will add fifteen years to your life. I will deliver you in the city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city for my own sake, and for my servant David's sake. So because my covenant with David made several hundred years before you even thought of existing, or your parents thought of causing you to exist, or taking part in that conception and birth, I thought of you, and for his sake, and I covenant with him, I will add 15 years to your life. And I will defend the city for my own sake, and for my servant David's sake. Verse 7, And Isaiah said, Bring a cake of figs, and let them take, and lay it on the boil, that he may recover. Let me do something in the figs. Or the Lord used the figs as a tool and he communicated something to the figs. And Hezekiah said to Isaiah, What shall be the sign that the Lord will heal me, and that I shall get, go up to the house of the Lord on the third day? And Isaiah said to this leader, This shall be the sign from you to, the, to you from the Lord, that the Lord will do the thing that he has promised. He asks you a question. Shall the shadow go forward ten steps or go back ten steps? And Hezekiah said, It is an easy thing for the shadow to lengthen ten steps. Rather, let the shadow go back ten steps. And Isaiah the prophet called on the Lord, and he brought the shadow back ten steps, by which it had gone down on the steps of Ahaz. So there was an ascension, likely a utilization of a time portal to affect time, so that Hezekiah knew... This thing is real. There's a lengthening of the day, meaning there's going to be a lengthening of his days. Yes? Are you sure it was a lengthening of the day? And not just you put the shadow back? I think it was a lengthening of the day because if the sun comes back, then that adds more time. If the sun, if the sun moves back in the sky and the shadows move back, I think what he's doing is he's showing via a lengthening of the day and an increase of the time of the day what he can do to somebody's time stream. Okay. I think the Lord utilizes a, a, a time portal that was probably there near the steps of Ahaz and said, hey, let me show you something. Oh. It is fascinating that he would actually mess with time because it would be really simple for him to just mess with the shadow and not mess with the time. Mm -hmm. Now, can I say that for sure? No, because I, we are also dealing with two cultures and two different ways of speaking because we are dealing with Hebrew versus English and the translation barriers that sometimes come into play. But I think there was probably something to do with time and either way, the day lasted that much longer. Which possibly mean the sun moved back a couple hours in the process. Which also caused the shadows to go back. Now, we get so caught up in dealing with... I am a leader. I have these rights or these responsibilities and I've been given the, all these gifts from the Lord 
And then we allow to overtake us the concept of, oh, these people are against me. They're treating me mean. They're doing the wrong thing to me. When the Lord is like actually with us and we get caught up in everything else that has very, that has less to do with our calling and more to do with the Lord allowing us to go through some things so that he can refine our motives. He's going to stick us into unjust circumstances where people are mistreating us or we feel people are mistreating us, whether or not they are, in order to grow us. He's going to stick you in some situations that are genuinely unjust. We do live in a fallen world because of our ancestors' stupidity. And everyone has free will. Yeah. We live in this world that other people mess things up regularly and we want to sit here and put the blame on everyone else rather than take responsibility for our part in it. In Adam, all sin. Meaning, we were all in Adam together. And had it been us, we would have done the exact same thing. I'm astounded that the Lord allowed Hezekiah to throw a test before him. All he had to do was wait three days and go to the temple and be declared healed. Why on earth did he need a... Oh, prove to me this is going to be true. And I, I'm astounded God um, allowed him that challenge and latitude. Here's the thing, too. The scripture in, in the text, either in the King's text or the Chronicles text, says that the Lord loved Hezekiah the way he loved David. Okay. There was an affection there. Now, let me point something out, too. In this 15-year time span, had Hezekiah not had 15 years added to him, Manasseh would never have been born. Manasseh was Hezekiah's son. Hezekiah's heart grew hard in the 15 years. So here's the question. If the Lord's going to lengthen your days, but those rest of your, the rest of those days are going to be hard-hearted, versus the Lord saying, okay, it's time for me to take him when his heart is tender 15 years earlier, When should somebody's life be taken in that regard? When their heart is tender or when their heart is hard? Tender. And yet the Lord gives you a gift of 15 years. If the Lord gave you a gift of 15 years, but you're caught up in what happened to you with all of your friends turning against you when you're 12, 13, and 14. And I can think of things when I was 12, 13, and 14. I can name names and still see people from elementary, middle, and high school, because that's how my memory works, of people that mistreated me and exactly what they did to me. My memory doesn't work nearly as effectively as his, and I could do the same. The pain is real, and it hurts. Um, but it's, it's, it's something that you've got to go th grow through and um, release, the sooner you release the bitterness and the unforgiveness and the, and the I hate you and I resent you and I'm going to hold on to this, the happier you're going to be, the better person you're going to be. Now, I have a question for y'all. Why am I paralleling this and why am I going to jump into the New Testament to the end of the book of John? What, is the, what does John 21 have to do with this passage? Any ideas? I've read John 21, so I wouldn't know. Okay. I don't recall the context of John 21 by number. Okay. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following him, John 21. Actually, I'm going to back up to verse 15. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon bar Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said a second time, Simon Barjona, the son of faith. Because you've heard my exposition in Matthew 16 when he called him Simon Barjona, and we don't know that his, na his dad's name was actually John. Do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon Barjona, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, 
you know all things, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, amen, amen, I say to you that when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch your hands out and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after that, he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. Verse 20 of chapter 21. The one who also leaned back against him during supper and said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Here's the punchline. Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. where we get a lot of our basis on you have to be responsible for you and you need to not worry about the brother and the sister and the everybody else. Okay? And we the have friends. to parent each person what part of their design and where they're at mature-wise. And it's the same thing. John, Peter was not to know what was going on with John. And, um, you know, whether John asked the question or not, John wasn't going to know what was going on with Peter. That's the Lord's job. People in your class, people in your friends, people in your family mistreating you. What is that to you? You follow him. Yeah. You follow weird. him. You do the thing that jumps you into the place of being the leader. Even if they're following the fifth head of Leviathan or whatever clown or whatever curse or whatever junk. You are aware of what's happening. You follow him. You follow him, 1 Kings 18, whether or not he lengthens your life. You follow him, John 21, whether or not that means you suffer more than anyone else. You follow him. And being a leader sometimes make it, um, needs you to be the servant. Yes. There's a lot of servant traits in leadership. It is a mark of maturity in a leader when they're willing to step into the gym when nobody else is because everybody else is so concerned about looking good and being good and preening and this, that, and the other. Yeah. Yes. And yes. all and all the assholes are being stupid and unwise and dumb and foolish and they're mistreating you and they're accusing you falsely and they're doing this, that, and the other. And be mindful of the fact that some of what you may be encountering as opposition or adversity may tie in to hypocrisy that you sowed months and years ago. You may be eating some of the fruit that you sowed in of inconsistency. So you have to ask the Lord, okay, Lord, help me parse out what was inconsistent, help me to be more consistent, and Lord, help me to endure the things I need to endure. There's another passage in Micah that I'm going to pull. While you're pulling that, can I say something? Go ahead, roll. If you, if, I agree that that is, that is a, a nuance that you will not hear often, and it's a good one. Um, it's important at that spot to say, am I reaping something I've sown? Whether it's hypocrisy or... You know, when you haven't walked in the fruit of the Spirit, or when you were mean to somebody and may not have even known it, or you were mean to somebody and you've kind of gotten that right, but the other, but there was still a sowing and a reaping. And at that point, you confess the sin. He'll tell you, confess the sin, ask for forgiveness, and ask Him to help you move forward from that and to handle this situation exactly the way He wants you to. That is the best response. And your best response when you're dealing with a sowing and reaping thing where you've done negatively and you recognize your stuff is to ask the Lord in His mercy for crop failure, if, if at all possible. What, crop that? failure. Crop. Oh, gotcha. All right, I'm with you. So the failing of the crop so that it doesn't continue to spin out of control, if at all possible. He might. He might answer that. He might not. You might have to endure. Uh, fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. What does Joyce Meyer say? Is it long suffering? Long suffering. Long suffering. So there's the, that's not that's not sexy and that's not lovely and that's not glamorous. That's grubby work. Yeah. 
as dirt under your fingernails, dig in trenches in the blazing hot sun for a season so that he can see you're really consistent. You really mean business. And no. you seriously, you're walking in the fruit of the spirit. You're going after it no matter what the cost. Yeah, and you want real super mature adult um, Christianity, adult Judaism, adult following the Lord, adult following Yeshua. Here it is, Micah 7, 9. Uh, Micah 7, 8. Rejoice not over me, O my enemy. When I fall, I shall rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he pleads my cause and executes judgment for me. Afterward, he will do that. After I have spent the season bearing his indignation. That's not fun, easy, light, fluffy Christianity. That's hardcore. Man up, woman up, grow your balls, grow your ovaries, deal with your junk, do your stuff. But if you take ownership for your own stuff, your stuff in the past, your current struggle, and he, he will honor that, he will say, you know what, I get it, and you, you screwed up, and now you realize it, now you're taking responsibility for it, now you're confessing it as sin, He's going he's gonna to have a gentle hand, more gentle hand towards you. He's going he's gonna to make sure you learn the lesson and you learn it well, but he is going to give you grace and mercy as much as possible for you to still learn the lesson because he loves you and he honors the heart that says, I've screwed up, I've been hard towards you, I've been nasty to others, I've been whatever I've been, but I'm going to change and you're yeah. going to help me. He honors that, he loves that. You walk toward him and he runs to you to help you. Yeah, he's own a daddy it. who loves you. Yeah, own it. Don't just bleh, own it. And he skillfully shows you how to play a harp of ten strings. He shows you how to move your fingers to deal with the bow of bronze to bend it. He shows you how to walk not just integrity of heart, but also with skillful hands because some of these tests that you're dealing with require you to have a little more skill in your hands, which is part of the reason why we're teaching you how to do handwriting properly so that when you get to the place where you need your fingers to be skillful and rock steady, say you become a master surgeon or something like that, and somebody's brain rests in you being able to move your hand millimeters this way or that way or keep it steady, you're able to do it because you were disciplined and taught how to do your cursive, how you do your handwriting, because that builds muscles that otherwise would not get used. Yeah, especially in this day and age where 95% of your work's on computers. It's not right. If you, your hands aren't learning the proper fine motor skills. So, as you're dealing with this, as you're dealing with, you know, correction or people who misunderstand you or whatever the case. Your job is to take all of those aspects, use them as a gym, converse with the Lord, ask him for mercy where he will where he will apply it, not coach him where the mercy should go, but ask him for it. And be able to have the character and the fortitude to say, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Mm -hmm. Come Holy Spirit. As my kids are dealing with, and as my wife and I are all dealing with various tests of many kinds. Mm -hmm. Help us to walk with you and to embrace what you have for us in it so that we can harvest the crop of righteousness that you have for us. Help us to hear what you are saying to the seven churches to apply what you are saying mm -hmm. to the seven churches and to walk and connect with you according to our design so that leadership can grow rather than offense. And, you know, I've got this situation that the Lord needs to fix and that situation the Lord needs to fix. Maybe the Lord is taking the situation that's unjust so that he can grow something deeper in you. Help us, Lord, to accept when you are using a painful situation in order to mold and form deeper, stronger in us, even if it's you know, carbon fiber lapped, uh, laced bones or 
adamantium or whatever the case, Lord. Something deeper, harder that is more necessary that will help us in the days to come. Yes. Strength. Life strong. Not just muscle strong, but life strong. Help us, Father. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Be blessed, guys.